Yo, my name is Jason Paul and this is an in-depth parkour and free running tutorial for beginners. Anybody who has no idea what they're doing. Let's get into it. If you're anything like me, you saw free running online and you fell in love with it and you were like, oh wow, that looks so fun, I would love to try that. But you had no clue how to do it. And I want to kind of give you everything you need to know to start teaching yourself. I want to kind of give you insight in what training, free running and parkour actually looks like because it's really hard to see how somebody trains just from their highlight video and in this tutorial I really want to go in depth, show you some techniques, some basics, how to build up to them and how we kind of train and what goes into it and that will kind of give you the tool set to get going. I get a lot of questions that kind of go like this. I'm too skinny, I'm too tall, I'm too good looking, I'm too heavy, I'm too old, am I too young to do free running? And the answer is always no, you're completely fine. And I've seen some incredible examples of people that are 50, 60, 70 years old that do free running, I've seen people that have that are missing an arm or a leg and they do some amazing skills and jumps. Of course you have to be honest with yourself and see where you are fitness wise and on, on your journey. If you're 50 and just getting into this, you might not become the best in the world, but you'll have a lot of fun and this is still a really fun journey for you to learn a lot about your body and explore it and explore the world around you in a different way. So no excuses, this is for you. Quick checklist, what do you need before you go out the door to do free riding? Um, t-shirt, something comfortable for clothing, you just really want something that you can move in and that you get like full range of motion in because your body will be doing a bunch of different movements. You want some comfortable pants, usually track pants work fine, some like stretchy jeans also go pretty good. And then for shoes, you usually just a pair of sneakers or sports shoes, nothing too fancy, a flat sole, grippy rubber, really kind of just what you got at home, just not high heels. As much as park and free running is a sport, it's also a culture with its own rich history and story that went into it, originating in France and then spreading out all across the world, just started by some kids who were exploring their world in a new way, and that kind of inspired the rest of the world to do the same. And I'm not going to go into it in depth, but it's really interesting to learn about it and become part of that culture. And one starting point is Max Henry's book, The Parkour Roadmap, and I really recommend that. So go to parkourroadmap.com to learn a little bit more in depth about where this came from and how we got to where we are today. You might be confused on what the difference is between parkour and free running, but the main thing is really that if you see somebody doing parkour or free running, you really can't tell by the movement what he's doing right now. It's all about the intention in a way. Somebody that does parkour is training a lot more with the mindset that he might be chased by somebody or he might have to climb into a building and save, save a person out of a burning building. So he's training with that intention to mind, which means it's a lot of efficient movement, it's a lot about being strong and healthy and how to be useful and kind of imagining how you'd move if you'd be chased by somebody who had to reach a certain location. On the other hand, free running is a lot more expressive, it's a lot more creative. You kind of go out with the idea, I have my, my body and my environment, what can I do with it? How can I express myself, be creative? And a lot of times those moves can be the same and if you're doing parkour and free running, that doesn't mean you can't train together, hang out together. It just means the intention is slightly different and sometimes the movement varies as well. But in general, it comes from the same spot and it, the ideas are very similar. And it, it's fun to dabble in both of them and play around and you can learn a lot from it. Obviously, parkour and free running is very athletic. You use all your muscles, you use your whole body. So what you should always do before every session is a warm up. Of course, a lot of you guys might feel like you don't need it or you kind of are lazy with it. And I understand that. I used to always say warming up is for microwaves, but I kind of learned from, from my mistakes and now I always warm up, even on a day that I feel like I'm all ready to go. And warming up can mean a lot of different things. I'm not going to go into it in detail in this video. A lot of you guys probably know how to warm up from a lot of traditional sports. Basically, you just want to do 
small versions of the movements you plan on doing in that session. You want to do some small jumps, get your joints ready, do some, some little dynamic stretches, or you just want to start moving around the spot slowly and slowly getting into the movement and progressing and not just doing your most difficult jump first. Because there's always a danger of like stretching or hurting a muscle or just injuring yourself. The kind of journey I want to give you the tools for is not just to go out and find a wall and jump around and have some jokes and have some fun. I kind of want to say yeah on the journey of becoming an athlete in free running because that's what this really is. It's not just going out and having a little bit of fun. It is a serious practice and you want to build like a strong body, a healthy body, really good awareness of movement and it is supposed to lead you into like this lifestyle of seeing the world differently, feeling feeling strong and being healthy and being able to move like your body is supposed to move and it is really important to kind of take it step by step and take your time doing that and this is where this tutorial is going to go and this is why I'm going to show you the techniques that we'll be covering. Obviously in free running there's a lot of jumping which means there's just as much landings and landings is something you should practice first you should really get into and kind of the rule of thumb in the beginning is that you shouldn't be jumping off of something that you can't jump onto. You want to really restrict yourself in height because it's not necessary to go too high to learn tricks in the beginning. You want to really learn how to land and tell what's a good landing and what's a bad landing first. In general, when you land, you want to land on the balls of your feet. And as a rule of thumb for you to tell what's a good landing and a bad landing, usually a quiet landing is a better landing and that's something that's good to aim for. All right, so as you can see, I'm landing on the balls of my feet, generally speaking in this area right here. You don't want your heel to touch the ground because that will send all the impact and the shock straight down your knees and your spine and it was really not healthy for your joints. Instead, you want your muscles to be doing all the work, which means you need a certain kind of tension when you land. If you do a jump and you hit the floor and your legs are too relaxed, what will happen is that your butt kind of hits your heels. And you can see there's really not enough tension there. I really just kind of collapse. The same thing happens if you're too stiff on the other end of the spectrum and you kind of just stomp a jump like that. As you can see, what kind of happens is my legs are really stiff and this forces my chest to drop down. This is something a lot of people do and it's really unhealthy because all the impact kind of goes into your lower back. You want to be a little bit more relaxed, stay more upright and go down and land nice and clean. I am not a scientist. I don't understand exactly the science behind this, but I can understand what feels right and what feels good and what feels healthy. And that for me is in general a really good rule to go by. So you really want to practice jumps, practice how stiff or strong your legs feel, when to relax and when to push against the impact and really listen to your body and what feels good and what feels bad. The previous just standard landing technique is mainly used if you're coming straight down but if you're going forward and you're moving with, with a lot of speed or even just a little speed, rolls are really a way to break your fall and to make it a softer landing. Rolls are a little bit complex, it's not something you'll kind of just learn and then you got it forever. For me it took almost half a year, year to like practice it again and again and again until I could really comfortably do it. And even once you've found your good side and you can roll on that, you also want to practice your wrong side because the roll is mostly like a safety mechanism. If something goes wrong, a lot of times the roll will be the thing that saves you. For me, I mainly roll over my right side and I'll kind of walk you through how it works. So say I'd be jumping off this wall, I want to get a, a little bit of a distance so I have some forward speed to transition into the roll. First things obviously is your legs will land first. So as your feet touch the ground, same rules, your heels shouldn't touch and you want to almost land falling forwards. So you want to land in this position and you want to bend your knees and then kind of push back out again a little bit into the roll. It's again, it takes a little bit practice to find the right tension. 
usually you don't want to go too, too, too deep, you want to stay around 90 degrees angle in your knees when you push into the roll as you fall forwards. And this way a lot of the energy doesn't have to be absorbed by your legs, it just kind of gets transferred into the roll. After your feet, the next point of contact is the forearm and your hand. So as I push off at about this distance right here, so if you put your feet and your knees down, your hands should kind of go right here. Obviously when you do the roll, your knees should never touch, just your feet. And next I put my left hand down, I put my arm and my forearm and my hand down, and then this part never touches the floor because you go straight from here to the back of your shoulder, your shoulder blade. You don't want to roll across this because you're in risk of breaking your collarbone. So you really want to be careful of that. So as soon as you push off, you really want to turn sideways and collapse your shoulder in. And that way you end up on this side of your roll. When you practice the roll, you really want to go slow. Start with sand, grass, concrete, and it takes a lot of effort. Rolls are a little bit different for everybody, so take your time to figure it out. It's really important. So this is what I'll do. Put these down. And then, as you can see, I turn sideways. I make a round back. I roll my shoulders in. And I go across from my right shoulder, across my back, to my left hip. Which brings me out in a position like this. If you roll over your right shoulder, you want to come up with your right leg straight. If you do it the other way around, your leg is going to be in your way as you get up. So, right shoulder, right leg is straight. Come out right here, push up, and as you get up, you're ready to kind of carry on and continue your run. I'll do one more, just from standing, which is the next progression, and then I'll do it from jumping for you as well. So as I said, don't get discouraged. The roll really takes a lot of time and practice and you want to get it to the point where you can comfortably roll on concrete, no pain. You want to practice diving into it, going into it at different speeds from different heights. And once you feel really comfortable, that means you're ready and you can play with it. A few problems that can occur for a lot of people is either hitting the head on the roll, which kind of means you want to tuck in your chin to get your head out of the way. A lot of people hit their, their shoulder and that often means you want to go a little more sideways, not straight over your head. And then, last problem a lot of people get is the spine, which could mean your back is too straight, or you have to roll more sideways as well. And then, the last problem area is hitting the back of your hip, or your butt too hard, which a lot of times means you're too straight and you're just falling over, you're not really rolling. So for that, you really want to focus on making a round back, and then just give it some time, give it some practice. It should be really painless and effortless. And once you have it, you'll have it forever. And it saved me many times, like falling off a bicycle or slipping after a jump. Rolls are goals. Goals are rolls. Your goals are rolls. I don't know. I don't know a smart way to say it, but definitely practice your rolls. Hello. So this is the lazy vault. You use a lazy vault when you're kind of running alongside a wall and you want to switch to the other side. That's when you use a lazy vault. So how does that work? The lazy vault works first by putting one leg and one hand down. So if you're putting your right hand onto the wall, your left leg is going to be your jumping leg. So you'll be jumping off and pushing onto this arm. And at the same time, your right leg is swinging up. So your right leg is all, all you're using to kind of lift your butt over the wall and you want to use your arm to pull yourself over and you put the left hand down behind you. I'll show you once. Kick up, jump, put the left hand down. That's literally it. You can kind of practice it by just jumping up, sitting on top of the wall and going down again. And then we'll just keep practicing it until you touch the wall less and less. And then you're doing it already. Learn it on both sides. Remember, jump off your left, put your right hand down, and kick up your right leg, and pull yourself over. Lazy ball. 
So the speed vault is literally called the speed vault because it's the fastest way over a wall if you're really running straight towards it. It's a little similar to the hurdle technique you'd see in track and field. You just use your hand for assistance because obviously the hurdle falls over if you touch it so you can't do that. So we can do that. So I'll show you how. First things first, you'll be running up straight towards a wall just like this beautiful wall. For the beginning it can be easier if you choose a wall that's a little bit wider just so you're not worried of missing the wall when you put your hand down. So what's gonna happen, you'll run towards the wall, you'll jump off your jumping leg, which for me is my left leg, and that means I'll swing my right leg up as I jump to get the height. While I'm doing that, I wanna bring my body into an inverted position. Get myself a little bit flat in the air so I can just clear the wall easily while I don't even have to jump up that high. It's really just about getting the body in that inverted position. Next thing I'll do is I'll put my hand down onto the wall and just touch it very briefly. It's not a very hard hit, but just that touch with the hand is enough to put your body back into the straight position. And then you land, for me, on my right foot. I jump off my left and then the right foot goes over, hits the floor and I just keep on running. When you do the speed vault, obviously, the more efficient you are, the closer you will be to the wall which brings your knees in danger of slamming against the wall. And if you're worried about that, especially for the beginning, I'd recommend finding a wall like this. A wall like this will make it able for you to practice the speed vault. And if your legs are not high enough and you can't lift them up, they'll just swish right by. And you can practice it here until you feel confident. And then you go over to the real wall and do it then. And you want to practice this move so it becomes second nature, get it on both sides. And you want to be able to do it without losing any speed. One of the biggest misconceptions is that you need a gym to start free running or to get really good at free running, which is not true at all. I think especially at the beginning, it's shown itself really useful not to have access to a gym because you train outside, you have to progress slower, you have to take greater care and you have a really good response for what is good and what is bad. In a gym, if you have a bad landing, if you have bad technique, you land on a crash mat and you just won't know that it's bad because it felt really good. While outside, if you do a jump and you don't have a correct landing technique, you feel really quick that it's painful or it doesn't feel comfortable and then you're able to adjust and you make these fixes a lot sooner than you would if you train in a gym straight away. So I would actually recommend, even if you have a gym, to go outside as much as possible to learn. Later on, when it goes to advanced tricks and acrobatics, it is super useful to go to a gym. But there's also been a lot of guys who've made it and are amazing athletes without ever really getting enough time in a gym to make use of it. So yeah, you don't need it, and especially in the beginning, even if you have one, get your ass outside. Obviously, this is an amazing spot. A lot of you guys, even me in the area I was growing up, I didn't have anything like this. This doesn't mean you can't do free running. There's literally so many options, there's so many little flower pots and railings and ledges. And you really have to work with what you have. If you live in the country, look at different trees and rocks and just get creative and don't get discouraged if you don't have as good spots as you see in videos because a lot of times some of the most creative and some of the most skilled freerunners come from an area where they have to work with something that's not ideal because if you're used to working with something that is not perfect once you get to spots that are a lot better you will be ready and prepared and it will be a lot more exciting a lot more fun to play so just look around your area look what you can find check out playgrounds check out public buildings libraries universities schoolyards they have a lot of good spots and one thing you really want to do is like you want to be inspired by your environment so don't get discouraged if it's different than what you see in videos because having a different environment and maybe less spots or maybe better spots will shape your style of how you move and you'll be unique in your style and in your free running and that is really important so really get inspired by what you find around it be creative accept the challenge and as you get better you'll find more and more things to play with Precision jumps are the heroine of free running. Why? They don't look really that attractive and sexy when you look at them the first time, 
but they can be really addictive once you get going, once you have fun with them. So precision jumps, it simply means doing a standing jump or running jump and landing precisely on another object, rail, wall, flower pot, whatever, and stick the landing as if there would be a height drop in front of or behind you. So you have to stick the landing. That's all kind of the, the sign if you made it and if it's clean, you have to stick it or it doesn't count. But really, the one thing you want to do to start is you want to find some lines on the ground. I know not very sexy, but it will really help you to kind of build up the confidence. So I'm going to go from this line to that little, little brick thing here. And I just imagine there's actually a gap in between. So for precision jumps, what do you want to do? You want to start on your toes, bend your knees as you get ready to jump, bring your arms back, keep your chest up, and you want to swing your arms as you jump. Now, a lot of people think precision jumps are just going, are just about going forward. So all they think about is jumping far. But you always want to leave the wall at kind of a 45 degree angle. So you don't just want to go far, you also want to go high. Imagine if you have a flight curve of me traveling through that other wall. If I just jump far, I will fly very flat and it will be very hard for me to stop my landing. So it's really hard for me to stop. So what I want to do instead is I want to go equally high as far and that way I will really arrive from the top and it will be a lot easier for me to kind of stick the landing. And at some point, you will get to the level where you can just look at a jump and you'll know I can do it or not. It's kind of an intuition thing. Especially for the beginning, it helps to really always measure with your feet and get an idea for where your, kind of where your maximum is. And then it's also really fun because you can see your jump grow and you can really feel that progression because you can measure it. So that's what's really addictive about it. You find precision jumps everywhere. They really aid and benefit your free running in every aspect. So getting clean precisions will give you leg strength, will give you lots of control and all your other landings. And there's just a lot of situations where they're useful. Look at this ledge. For the precision jump, you want to know how the ledge thinks. You want to be the ledge. You want to feel the ledge. You want to smell the ledge. You want to taste it. And then you're ready for the jump. Oh, see that was not that clean. That wasn't that good. My heel's touching it. Your heels should never be touching it. If you mess it up, go again. That was nicer. So you really want to make the landing soft and it should feel really effortless. Again, you don't want to be too stiff. At the same time, you don't want to be too loose so your butt kind of bounces against your heels. You really want to find that middle where the precision feels really nice and soft. Once you get comfortable with jumping to a ledge, you want to jump from a ledge to a ledge. Like here. Find a distance that's really comfortable and then practice it and slowly progress. Ta -da! Cool. Once you get comfortable with this, you really want to step it up slowly and slowly and slowly. And as you get more precise, you can get you will just find more precision, like this one over here. What is it? Do I have to do like a disclaimer if people get addicted to precision jumps? Uh, is it my fault? Like, I think a big part of England's UK youth is heavily addicted to precision jumps. They neglect their families, their school, their friends. They have their own little precision jump crews. They hang out in like dark alleyways like this and do precision jumps for hours. It really destroys their social life. They get sore and just stay at home because their muscles hurt, they're in pain. It's really dangerous to do precision jumps. Just be careful. Not even once. Precision jumps, not even once. Obviously, precisions are your plan A. You always want a plan B in case something goes wrong. And these are different ways you can save a precision in case you mess up. Number one is bouncing off of the ledge. So you don't quite make the distance and you're falling backwards. You don't want to land back on your head or on your butt. So this is what you want to do. You just want to bounce off. And you really want to practice that before it actually happens in real life. What's important about it is that when you bounce off, you don't want to bounce off too far. Because obviously there's another wall where you're coming from. So if I'm jumping here, I'd bounce off and I would fall too far, I would land straight with my back or my head back on this ledge. Which you can imagine is pretty uncomfortable. So you bounce off. You really want to land close when to bounce off, so you can't hit the wall you're coming from. 
The next thing is cranes. If you've ever watched Karate Kid, you remember this scene, which is the crane technique. Well, a little secret, originally it's a free running technique if you don't make the full distance of a precision jump and then you want to kind of crane it because often it's a lot easier to just get one foot up, up than two so if it goes wrong you can always do this kind of get all your strength here get this foot grippy against the wall and sometimes you even want to grab it so you can save yourself in case it goes wrong do you know how to crane? I wish I could. that happens when you don't crane you hurt yourself what happens when you crane? Dash, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing, but it's fun. Let's do one. Dash! So, how do you learn a dash? I think the easiest thing is that you get a really like good lazy vault first. Because the lazy vault is very similar to the dash, but you remember for the lazy vault you're running along the wall, and now you want to practice your lazies and slowly move out the angle you run towards the wall at. So it's really a slow progression. So you can do your lazies, next you want to do a lazy from here, which will look like this. And then next you want to go even a little bit more and do your lazies like this. And then slowly you'll feel like you get more and more close to running straight towards the wall. So when you come to the point where you're like, right, I'm getting more comfortable with this, I actually want to do a dash. This is what you want to do. You run towards the wall, you use your jumping leg, you're going straight at it, your foot is straining at that wall, your shoulders are straight as well. And as you jump off this leg, you want to swing everything else up. And you want to be careful not to lean too far backwards. So that way you want to bring both feet above and over the wall, kind of keep them high up, and then you reach behind and push off the wall and kick your legs towards the ground. Of course, doing it first, you want a wall that's thicker than this. Because this, the day most dangerous thing is missing the wall, hitting your beautiful butt on it, you don't want that. What helped me doing it the first time, I would jump over and just do it with one hand. Just use the left hand first. Then I'd just use the right hand and I'd slowly get towards using both. It's, it's just a really cool move to get when you're starting free running and then it's kind of useful in a lot of little awkward situations so you want to kind of get good at like just practicing and you want to kind of learn to jump into it a little bit you want to learn to really push out of it and get some distance and it's really fun to do it after after kongs as well next up is the kong and it's called because you're kind of doing a King Kongy kind of thing with your arms. Kong is all about going over obstacles in a straight forward motion really fast. It's like probably the like coolest trick out of this whole video you're gonna learn. It's also probably the scariest one. It can be used in many different situations. It can be used in a lot of combinations. People push Kongs to like a ridiculous level. You can double Kong, you can dive Kong, you can combine it with pretty much everything you can flip out of it like pretty much if you got this move you're already working up to a lot of different variations and things you'll have a lot of fun for it forever to learn it the easiest the safest the most comfortable way is to find an obstacle like this a really nice block find a height that kind of feels comfortable probably a little bit lower than this at first like ping pong tables are a really great way to learn and that's how I learned mine what you want to do there's a bunch of different things I kind of want to point out for the Kong that are really important and you want to practice them one by one. Don't try to do all of them for the first try. Kind of go step by step by step by step. We're going to start with just standing in front of your block, both hands on top. The block should be high enough that you can just do a simple standing jump on top of it. So now what you want to do is you want to jump off both feet and land with your feet on top of the block. While you jump, you know how on a standing jump you'd be swinging your arms? Instead, you'll be pushing with your arms up to give you that extra pop and height. And then as soon as you jump and push, you wanna move your hands away to make space for your legs. Show you once. Three, two, one. Pull. There we go, that's it. All right, so once you can do that, you wanna repeat it a few times. And now I'll show you how to step into the Kong. 
And for first, you don't even want to run into it. You just want to kind of take one step into it. What we use for the Kong and for a lot of different vaults is the split foot technique to jump. So what you're going to do is you're going to step into it one by one, right foot, left foot, and then you want to jump off of both feet at the same time. So that kind of technique allows you to use the speed that you get from a run up, but you still get the power from both of your legs as if you're jumping from two feet. You kind of want to try around, usually your jumping leg will be the leg you have in front for the split foot technique. Also, the kind of distance your feet have from each other during the split foot technique varies. If you're going on a, for a very high Kong, your feet tend to be closer together. If you're going for a really far Kong and you're diving into it, usually your feet will come apart a little bit more. So that always varies, you have to play around with it. Right, so as you do the split foot, your arms will do the same thing they would do during a running jump. So they kind of go back, swing up, and then push. And this gives you a really a lot more pop and a lot more height. Have a look at my arms. Cool. cool. That is already one big mistake a lot of people make out of the way. A lot of people come in and they think they have to slam their hands from the top onto the obstacle. The arms actually come from the bottom and then give you a push up that way. The last really important thing is what your chest does. Because you want to really, or the Kong is all about traveling high and far after an obstacle a lot of times. So what your chest does is as you step into it and swing your arms, you want to kind of dip your chest a little bit. And as you Kong, you want to push it up and you want to get your chest as high as possible. You really want to be proud like the prince. This is how the prince walks. This is how you do the Kong, boom. So obviously, you wanna to work towards this point where you can do the Kong over a wall. The reason we are doing it onto a block is that if you clip your feet or hit your knee, you don't have a drop, you fall down on the other side. The worst thing that can happen is literally this. There you go, it's really safe, really safe way of practicing it. And what you wanna practice is you wanna do the Kong on the first attempts you'll literally just land on the ledge. Now we need to slowly push further and further until you can really get some good distance on a Kong. All right. Once you can get a certain distance behind the obstacle, you know you can do it over a wall. So that's what you'll do next. So one misconception a lot of people think you have to do when you do the Kong is something I want you to pay close attention to in the slow-mo replays. A lot of people think your knees will actually have to pass in between your arms while your arms are still on the obstacle and that is very hard to do and that is not what's happening during the Kong at all. The moment your knees pass over the obstacles your arms are already in the air. You're not even touching the obstacle anymore. You really just touch the obstacle for a brief moment and then you float over it and your knees never have to pass in between your arms. What you do want to do though is you want to keep your knees close together and you want to be like one strong compact unit and then as soon as you're over the obstacle you want to open up and land that's the kong play with it try diving into it play with gaining more distance behind the obstacle or in front of the obstacle and then use it in many different ways and variations kongs So this tutorial is supposed to give you advice to teach yourself how to do parkour and freerunning. However, the number one advice I can give you is to find other freerunners and learn it by watching them and asking them questions and getting their advice because that is really the best way to get into it and to dive in deep. And the best way to find other freerunners is through the internet. Go online, go on whatever social media is happening at the time, go to Google, type in the name of your city, the name of your state, the name of your country, area, whatever, and then parkour or free running. Find those groups where people organize and chat and then send them a message, link up. The cool thing is 
Our community is super friendly to beginners and newcomers. If you show up, you've never done it before, that's completely fine, everybody understands. And people will be excited to show you the ins and outs and to give you advice that will help you move on. So I really recommend that. It is also the most fun and rewarding part of doing free running. We're just walking around, looking around London right now. And we found these bars, which are actually a really good like beginner spot. This is what you want to look for, like a quiet area, just some bars. So you can draw some basics, you can draw some vaults, especially all the vaults I showed you on the walls, you want to eventually progress to the bars. And one move that is really kind of unique to bars is the underbar and the 360 underbar, and I'm going to show you both of these, and then also a combo with both in one line. Everything else is kind of over bar because you go over the bar, so the underbar is the underbar because you go under the bar. Got it. You want to start from standing. So you're standing right in front of the bar. You can already reach it. And step one is just jumping up to it like this. Pop. Pop. Step one, done. Step two, jump to the bar. And you want to point your toes and slowly slide through. And then pull your way through. Whoops. So now you just want to keep doing that and get a little bit quicker all the time until you can actually jump up and just stick your feet through without touching the bar. So we do this, pop, point your toes, slide through. Keep like some stability in your, in your arms. You really want to use your arm strength right here to lower yourself slowly. And then eventually you'll get to this point. Boom. Once you get the underbar standing, you want to do them running. So you can build them into like combos and lines. So what you want to do is you want to jump off one leg, swing the other one up, and then you want to bring your legs back together and just point them through the gap. So it will look like this. And as you see, it's important that you really catch your weight with your arms. And obviously the one thing that you should be worried about on underbars is always hitting the bottom bar with your butt or with your back. The one thing you should focus on to avoid that is just staying as close as possible to the top bar. What do you think? Not impressed. Next up, 360 underbars, they look like this. Ho ho! Okay, step one. Hand goes at the top, then your other hand crosses over at the bottom and also grabs the bar. Your hands never leave the bar, so they stay like this. What you want to do is you want to dip down with no legs, then you want to slowly uncross your arms. What do you call that? I don't know. That's what you do. And you pull yourself through and then you just slowly get your legs out. And the good thing about this move is you can literally do it as slow as you want, step by step, very, very slowly. Keep your arms tight, keep your chest close to the bar, watch your head. That's the one thing you have to be careful always. And then just keep getting quicker and quicker and quicker and quicker until you're like, ha! super speed. Now underbars are really good for combos, as you can see right now. Ta-da! The good thing is as your underbars get better, they become a pretty epic move. There's a lot of cool things you can do with it. You can dive into them, you can swing out of them and precision and go through really tight gaps and it's, just really fun to do. Reverse vaults. You've waited for this moment or not. I don't care because we're doing reverse vaults. If you're from Spain, skip this tutorial. You can already do it. If you're not from Spain, you'll have to learn it and your reverse vaults will never look as good as if you'd be from Spain. So, I run up to the wall. I jump from my two legs. That's how many I have. Put my left arm down like this, put my right arm down like this, and I'll be turning around my right arm. So my right arm carries most of my weight, all my weight, and my left arm leaves the wall very early. What's very different for this vault, when you jump, you almost want to be facing with your back towards the wall completely. So you'll kind of be here. And then you'll jump over the wall, backwards, turn, and land facing that direction again. To kind of start into it, first thing you want to do is you want to just jump over it like this. Land facing the wall again, right hand still on the wall. And if you can do that quite easily, you just want to practice adding that extra twist to it. So it could look like this. Boom. 
if even that's too scary, a lot of people like just chucking it like that and it kind of works. But a safer way to work for it is to look for a wall like this that ends and then you can really just practice it next to the wall and that's really all it is. Run up, put your hands on the wall, do a turn and land facing that way. And then you want to work on getting your hips higher and higher and higher. And that's it, reverse wall. Really fun wall, wall. you can make it look really cool. A lot of situations you can do it in, fun to play with. Maybe my favorite ball with the Kong ball is a tie. I don't know. So now that we have a few moves, what we want to do is not necessarily pile on more and more and more different tricks and movements, but you want to start combining some moves. And this is a perfect spot for Kong to a precision landing, which means I'm going to Kong over this wall and I'm going to try to stick the landing on the wall over there. So it's the first time we're trying it, so bear with me. So usually you want to do one just kind of to feel out the distance and feel what it feels like. So now I feel like I'm getting pretty close and I feel like with a little bit more speed I'll be able to hit it. There we go, pressure was on, got it. Alright, so in the context of being here I want to talk to you guys about Breaking down movements, especially if you're scared about a move. As you can imagine, fear is a topic for anybody who is in free running or parkour. There's always a move that you're scared of. There's always something that you might be worried you're going to injure yourself. So let's talk about the two different sides that I see when it comes to fear, which is the technical approach, how to actually deal with it when you find something you're scared of and you want to do it and a philosophical approach is how you deal with it in like the big picture of things. So, philosophically, I feel like for me fear has been something that will always be there, that I'll always be scared about something again and again and again because I'm always trying to progress and push myself. However, the one thing that I will always get better at or that I have gotten really good at is overcoming my fears. So now when I'm scared, I can really rationally look at it and be like, why am I scared? Is it reasonable for me to be scared? Is there really something I should be worried about that I should, be, that I should address or reason for me not to do this? Or am I just scared because it's something new, but it is actually that I'm well capable of and that I can do safely. And if I decide that it is the latter one, then I can actually go and do it and overcome that fear quite easily. How do you get there? So, Practicing overcoming your fear, to me, is kind of like meditation. It's not something you can do once, you are super scared of this trick and you just throw yourself into it and then you're never scared of it again. Kind of the opposite is true. If there's something I'm terrified of and I push myself to just do it, then even if I do it, I might still be scared about it or more scared than I was before. So what I do is I kind of take the approach of meditations and that means by doing it every day and by doing something small or something that I'm a little bit scared of every day I get better at overcoming my fear I get more in touch with how I feel about something and when it is safe to push myself and when it is risky so when it comes to fear be patient take it one step at a time if there's something you're super scared of don't worry you'll get better at overcoming your fears now when it is something like this, we're at a spot, there's a move that I want to do and I'm scared of it, this is what I do. Step one is, the rule is that practice will make you more confident. It will lead to confidence. So you want to do everything you can to minimize risk and to prepare you for what you're about to do. So if there's something you're scared of, you feel like you're too scared to go and commit, then you want to take a few steps back and think about what can I do to prepare myself for this? What can I do that is similar that will make it easier to come back here and then do this trick? For the Kong to Precision, where I want to go from here to there, I want to think about is there a similar jump in my neighborhood that I can do? What's cool with the Kong is that I can simply jump over the wall and I can get a feeling for how close am I to the landing. And then I want to practice similar jumps and similar movements to work up to it. 
The next thing you re I really do with every move is I try to break it down into its parts and I try to practice all the separate building blocks of that movement. So for the Kong it would be, there's the run-up, the run-up, and then I really try to think about why is the run-up important for this move. The run-up for the Kong will give me the distance that I need to hit the wall. So that's why I have to practice. All right, what's the right speed? And you really want to take time to like think about every single building block. Why, why is the run-up important? How fast should I be? And that will change for every different setup. So you really want to understand the reasoning behind why you're doing what you're doing. The next part of the Kong would be taking off of the floor and pushing off the wall with an arm swing. Why is this part important? Is what I ask myself. And it's, oh, this is because I'm running, which means I have a lot of speed going forwards, but I also want to be going up. So that's why I use the takeoff and the push to get myself high and to land nicely on the, on the next wall. So that way I go through the whole movement. I would think about what happens once I'm in the air. What position do I want to have to land nicely on the next wall? Do I want to lean back a little bit? Do I want to lean forward? And that will all change with the spot and with the move. So there's no one solution I can give you, but you want to kind of practice breaking down all the different parts of a move. Think about every body part. What are my hands doing? What are my wrists doing? What are my fingers doing? arms, chest, body position, speed, you want to take everything in account, then you, you can also go and you can just practice those parts. So for example, you could just be doing this. Boom. And now you're practicing the run up, the speed, the arm swing. Just now I slipped a little bit because it's wet. So that practice run already now protects me from slipping when I would have just done it. So now I'm like, oh, okay. It's slippery, it's wet. That's something you have to think about. Maybe you have to go a little bit slower. And that way you work yourself up to it. And that practice and going through all that is gonna give you the confidence to then go and do it. So those are the two sides. Practice leads to confidence. Practice, 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 break it down. If it's too scary, find something easier and work on that first. And then the philosophical side that will be, don't worry, you'll get better all the time and just do something small that scares you every session and you will get there eventually. One thing I love doing and I really recommend if you're training by yourself and you don't have anybody to give you feedback is just grab your phone, grab your GoPro, grab any camera you have, doesn't matter. Record it if you can in slow-mo. Most phones have like legit quality nowadays so shoot yourself, watch it back, kind of figure out what you're doing right or wrong go home and compare it with videos. Okay. All right, let's go. Let's have a look. That is me. Look at this job. Oh, boom. How do I do it? Yeah, so this is something I do because I'm a very lonely person and I'm out by myself. Nobody wants to hang around with me. So I'll film myself, get excited about it, and then improve on my technique and get even more excited about it. That's me. Doing a reverse. It's probably the highest I've ever done. All right, we're getting funky. Funky. So what we're doing right now, if you can do the lazy vault, I'm gonna show you a little variation that will then progress into a tic-tac. Tic-tac is any kind of pushy motion like this. This is all tic-tacs. See, it's fucking, it's crazy. Tic-tacs are like everywhere. One, two, three. Tic-tacs, tic-tac opportunities are literally everywhere and that's why it's such a badass move. <laughs> I spat on the lens. And now for this move, you remember how on the lazy vault you were kind of jumping off your left leg in this circumstance you'd swing your inside leg. If I'd just be doing a lazy vault, left foot first, swing my right leg and I'd be over. But since we've done lazy vaults and we're kind of done with them, we want to do something cooler, we want to step it up. So same setup, but now check what happens. Leg switch, oh, okay. So now, right hand in this case, right foot, 
and you want to swing your left leg up onto the wall and you want to push off off the wall and over again right leg right hand you swing this leg up really nice and high this leg gets your hips above the ups obstacle and then once your foot touches you want to swing your right leg over the wall and then you will land on your right leg again so nice and slow this leg boom you see it the other way around everything obviously is switched and this leg you see swings through boom all right all right all right i got it this was too easy for you i already knew it you're pretty good at this so i'm going to show you the next step which is no hands tic tac we want to go over that wall without touching it could be really useful if it's like a fence or something spiky barbed wire or it's just you just want to be cool and not use your hands step one you kind of want to usually you'd start with something that's lower than this matter of fact you really kind of want to just practice tic tacking off a normal wall so what you want to do is you want to run up and you don't want to jump against the wall you almost want to do a step off the wall and the way you do it is first you want to kind of practice just sticking to the wall so no, jump against the wall and kind of try to stay on it as long as you can and once you got that you want to practice pushing off again so things you want to really pay attention to and think about is that your leg on the wall obviously does all the pushing while this leg is pushing off the wall you want to help it out with the rest of your body so what you'll do is as you push you want to swing your leg up to give you some height and you also want to pull your arms up pay attention you want to really practice getting really high with these tic tacs once you got that next step is to do that and land on top of a wall and next step is doing the same thing but going over the wall I think when doing tic tacs it's, it's really hard to teach them and I can't give you the, all the instructions so you get them straight away you have to kind of play around with the different speeds you'd hit the wall at and the angles you will hit the wall and those will always change from jump to jump as well the thing is usually people jump at the wall when you kind of want to hit the hit the wall with a, a jump off the floor as high as you can so if you run up to the wall instead of jumping far at it you want to jump really high and you want to push off it as your body is still moving upwards and kind of give yourself an extra push to support the height you're already getting off that jump and that really takes a little bit of practice and getting used to it and just kind of finding the right sweet spot in the middle so give tic tac some time and then they're like super fun and you feel like they really make you feel cool that's the cool thing about them you just kind of <laughs> doing the turn ball how does the turn ball work what it's about it's all about turning as you probably guessed because you're one of my smart viewers the turn ball is mostly used if you have a wall like this and there's a drop on the other side and you just want to get down safely or you want to transition into a different move first of course you want to practice it with no drop on the other side and I'll run you through it real quick you'll have two hands on the wall and different to a normal ball where you just go over like this you want to always have one arm on your wall that arm is your safety and you'll be turning around that arm and it never leaves the obstacle in order to do that you'll have to invert the arm and grab the wall like this and that way you can turn all around the wall and it never leaves you obviously want to learn both sides pick the side that feels more comfortable to start with run up to the wall place both arms on it and then for, for starters you want to just jump up if your left hand is inverted, you want to place your right foot on top, take away your right arm, swing your left one through, turn, and lower yourself down into a hanging position. Once you did this, you want to progress to doing it without that step, obviously. So let me go back. Again, you run up, you will place both feet next to each other, jump from both feet, arm placement as we discussed, jump over the wall, turn and grab it again lower your bar and hang on the wall done once you can do it here comfortably and really easy you want to progress to doing it with a little bit of a drop so let's have a look at that too
Once you get better at the turn vault, you'll run into situations like these where there's a drop on the other side and you want to find a safe and easy way down and often the turn wall is the way to go. And the different situations you'll kind of have is you'll have kind of a ledge here and you'll have the wall. Most dangerous thing is, I'll show it this way, a lot of people will do the turn vault, put their feet too high and you're falling, no! This is a little bit high to start. Once you get with the, comfortable with the turn vault, you really want to find a low drop on the other side and just practice it, practice it, practice it. Get comfortable, practice what height foot placement works for you, how to grip the wall the right way. Just practice it in different environments. I'll do one for you right here with the ledge where you really want to take your time on the turn and make sure your feet hit that ledge. So this is kind of the final discipline of the turn vault, which is a turn with a wall on the other side. It's the most difficult. This is a very grippy wall. Sometimes you have a slippery wall and it's even harder. Most important thing is the danger of putting your feet too high. If your feet are too high, you don't have the strength to hold yourself and you fall backwards, as I illustrated beautifully before. As you saw here, you can either put both feet onto the wall at the same time. A lot of the times, you kind of want to do them one by one. So you bring one foot down first and then you kind of sink into it and place the other one. Like one thing you want to pay attention to is that your body weight should always be on top of your arms. You don't want to, because this is where you're strong and you can hold yourself and you have control. As soon as you let your weight come out too much this way, it becomes really hard for you to, to hold yourself on it. And also, if you keep your weight on your arms, you can really take your time doing the turn. You don't have to rush it and you can go nice and slow. And when you lower yourself down, I think the safe thing you should concentrate on is keeping as close to the wall as possible. Don't let your butt stick out. Stay close to the wall and then slowly lean back into it. It's a very slow and controlled movement. It's not very abrupt. Practice low first and very slowly progress into higher levels as you feel comfortable. A lot of people kind of think you just go to a spot and you instantly see this really cool thing to do when most of the time you, you like rock up to a spot especially if you live somewhere where the spots are not that great you rock up to something like this and you're like oh it's kind of I find something here and you're like desperate and you're like playing around and you're like oh maybe I'll find like something and you massage the spot and you keep playing and you move around and all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, okay, this is something, this is something. And you get into it and you're like, all right, I can go from here. Now end up here and you're like, oh, where can I go? And then you kind of, maybe you don't come up with the coolest thing ever, but in the way you come up with a, uh, with a creative line and you come up with something that really suits that spot. And that's really the, the progression that happens every time you go out. You kind of like, you hang out in an area for a longer time. You play with it and you kind of, it's like a little Rubik's Cube puzzle. You have to like, Every move puts you in a different place and you have to like figure out how it works. There's really a way of it, a sense of achieving. I can't get in the gym, I can't get doing any other sport. All this probably looks really silly compared to what we do in videos. But like this is literally a big part of my training is just like playing around with small stuff like this and getting used to it and getting comfortable and like knowing that I can make mistakes and nothing bad is gonna happen and then just working on it and then finding trickier and trickier moves and then some spots are really good for it, some spots you don't find anything, but you always want to kind of play and play and play. And if you feel like, ah, oh, this spot is kind of boring, there might be nothing here, you want to keep playing with it and using it, massaging it. And then maybe you come with something really cool, or maybe not. It's interesting because a lot of these things I've just 
did most of it and most of the things you come up at a spot like this none of those are moves I could give you a name for I, I couldn't say what was the, the the weird move I did around the tree or the swing and all those moves don't have a name because they kind of come from the situa situation and the environment and you can't teach that you have to go out and teach yourself and, and learn it in a way by just doing it and that's how like the real creative process happens is not doing a move in a gym or just watching a tutorial on a trick and then doing that outside that doesn't make you creative that just makes you a, a copy in a way it's really important to learn those tools but you have to enjoy this process as well and that is really fun to me and I can love it and a lot of times people look at me and are like what is he doing but it's like it's just fun and you don't have to care and just do it and if you can't enjoy that then I don't know free running is for you <laughs> to be honest because this is it for me like this is just as much part of it and let's be real mistakes always happen nobody's perfect and actually I think making mistakes is really a part of progression free running means for me learning by trial by error going out and trying something not making it and then figuring out what's in the next but Obviously, the moment you slip and something goes wrong is the most unsafe moment of free running. And you want to kind of practice to be safe even in an unsafe environment and in a stress environment and situation. So, what we'll do for it is we'll kind of just do it on purpose. So, what you'll do is you'll learn a move and you'll, have, you'll force yourself to think about what could go wrong. I could cut my foot, I could like, hit my knee here, I could bump myself onto that obstacle in that way. And then you kind of just want to go and do it, see what happens, and find a way to save yourself. And that way you're adding all these plan B's and plan C's to your bag of moves. And if something happens, you're ready and can just save yourself. And you walk out of it and you'll be all right and keep on training. So that's something we really enjoy doing. It's just bailing on purpose. It's fun and sometimes you even come up with a new trick that way. So now we're going to do something epic. It's called the arm jump. It's kind of one of the like more animalistic and manly moves. I like this intro because this is literally one of like the setups how I would learn an arm jump. And I know a lot of people and a lot of you guys are really tempted to go really high and do stuff and to kind of try to strive for straight away what the people you've seen the videos are doing. But in reality, even the people that you watch in videos who do amazing moves and massive things and things that are in great heights they start like this and they're not just start like this they still train like this most of the time very low to the floor very safe and that's how you can push yourself and once you're very confident then you can slowly go a little bit higher so i'll show you a few different arm jumps this is the first one this is what you should kind of start with very safe a lot of room for error so we're going to hit that arm jump arm jumps are kind of for when you would want to reach the next obstacle you want to cross a gap but you can't make it to the top of the wall so you want to land in a hanging position so I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna end up over here the most common mistake people make is that they want to be safe so the first thing they want to do is they want to get their hands on the wall so what happens is they'll jump out and they'll reach for the wall their hands will hit first and then their legs swing and hit the, the wall very forcefully so we want to do exactly the opposite. The average person, your legs are way stronger than your arms. You want to jump and you want to hit the wall with your legs first, leaning back a little bit. Let your legs take the impact while they usually slide down a little bit. And just then you want to just grab the walls. Your arms actually take very low amount of the impact. So in practice, it kind of looks like this. I want to make the old school and English free runs proud, you always got to pull yourself up afterwards. If not, they'll look like at you and do this. We'll move on to a little bit of a bigger arm jump, and that way you can see how the technique works a little bit better, but this is what you really want to start with. So this is a little bit of a bigger arm jump. Do it real quick so you can see. As you can see, it's a little bit higher. So if I fall, I'm already in risk of hurting myself. So I have to be very careful. And for these arm jumps, you always want to be ready to bounce off the wall in case you don't make it. So what's important for that is that you don't lean back too much so you can land on your feet if you do not make it. And now we'll do a running and 
in the running jump I can really show you I'll probably exaggerate it a little bit how your feet hit the wall first take the impact and then you grab almost immediately after but hitting first with your feet is really important these walls are really grippy but on a different wall you'll probably slide down a little bit and that's all good I have to like imagine you like you're a person right now watching this video and I'm imagining what you look like I have to imagine I'm talking to you because I have to tell you how important it is to learn how to bounce off walls. It's really important because a lot of times you won't make an arm jump or you kind of just want to test an arm jump and see how close you can get. And that's why you really want to work on just like running up to a wall, hitting it with both feet and bouncing off at like different heights and different levels. So for example, if I'd want to find out if I can make the top arm jump and I want to kind of gauge it, I just do this. Right, so now I'm like, oh cool, that kind of works and the next time I can like fully commit to it. But this way you can get an idea and you also are prepared if something goes wrong. So really practice that, work on it and have it unlock. If not, you're going to bruise your butt. And if you have a really good looking butt like me, it's the last thing you want to do. Alright, as you can see the spot is filling up a little bit. Locals are showing up throughout the day, that's the cool thing in London. One of the main spots, these guys are like from Poland and the States, from the UK and they're just dropping in and training. That's really cool about the community, you always get to meet new people and when you travel you always run into people at the local spots, especially in a big city like this. Sorry if it's a little bit loud because I don't want to disturb these guys. I'm going to show you a 180 now, which is really a lot of times what you'll do after an arm jump when you want to return back. You can do it in different ways, you could end up back in another arm jump. If you're really good you can even go upwards. I'm going to do a 180 to precision onto that wall. So this is a lower wall, just so I can show you what's happening. You'll be hanging on the wall right here. And what you want to do is you want to get your chest as high as possible. And just then, when you're at your highest point, do you want to push off and turn away and do a 180 degree turn. You have to kind of decide whether you want to turn to the left or the right. Depending on what's more comfortable. Again, always practice both sides. So if you want to travel to your left side, you want to push off your right leg. So you'd be hanging here. You want to pull and really get your chest as high as possible. And then you want to also get your foot really high. A lot of people will even get their feet literally between their hands, chest really high. And then you push off with your foot. And as soon as possible, you want to look over your shoulder and aim for where you're going. This is kind of what we go through if we're not sure if we can make a jump or not. Or if it's just us doing the jump the first time. Right now, I'm looking at doing a 180 off of this wall and landing on top of that wall. And to get a feeling if I can even do it or not, the easiest thing is literally to find a spot like this. This one's perfect because it's actually exactly the same spot. And I can do the jump next to the wall and kind of eye out and get a feeling for how it would feel to do it to the wall. So literally this is what I'll do. Now you can kind of see I had like a, a good height. I landed even behind that wall. So it's pretty likely that I can make it. In worst case, I can always bounce off and land back on the floor. All right. So I was just making it. Again, you see like it's really important that you learn how to bounce off safely if you don't make it. And that way you can really slowly progress and get to it. On the one before, I was leaning back a little bit too much. So I have to kind of remind myself that as with most precisions and most movements like this, I really want to go up, turn my shoulders full 180 so they're square with the wall. And most importantly, really keep them above my feet, above my hips really, so that I land on top of it and I'm straight. Especially for these kind of movements, it's really important that you don't just worry about going far because then you'll really come to a really uncomfortable landing. You want to jump in a really nice arc, so you want to go up and then far. That way you get a really nice curve and you end up coming down onto the obstacle. Obviously, the one thing you need for free running are a good pair of shoes. Training barefoot is an option and it's really good for your technique, but at some point you want to find the right shoes for your style, for your training, and that can mean many different things. I think for beginners, 
really a normal pair of sneakers is, is all you want. A lot of times having not as much cushioning, especially in the beginning, will help you to, to learn clean landings because you'll feel straight away if you're doing something wrong. And then later on, I think it's good to progress to something with more cushion as you kind of do bigger jumps and, and want that and have a better sense of what's a good landing and what not. So what I look for in a shoe is, um, I always look for a flat sole, a rubber sole, so it's durable, it won't break. I look for a shoe that's at light, as light as possible. I kind of want the shoe to be flat and the sole to be flat as well so I don't roll over. I want the top part of the shoe to be really nice and sturdy because you have a lot of sudden stops and your toes will be hitting the front of the shoe on your precision jumps and a lot of those movements. So you don't want the top to be all out of like fragile mesh or it's going to rip. And that's really the most important thing is good grip flat sole, as much cushioning as you can get, um, sturdy at the top, you want to be able to like wear them really tight. A lot of times my free running shoes will be a size smaller than what I usually wear and then I'll slowly walk them in and after a week they will be just perfect. One thing that really always happens is the shoe will break. What you're doing is really hard for the material and no shoe will last forever. So find the best you can get, go to a shoe store, look around, maybe just look at some beat up shoes you still have that are kind of, will do the job for now and then kind of learn what you like and what suits your style as well. One of the cool things is people look at free running and it initially reminds them of what they did when they were a kid. They would be at the playground and they'd climb around, they'd jump around and a lot of times free running is exactly that. It's about going back into the mindset of being a kid again and exploring your city. And in training, a lot of times we do this by giving us challenges and playing little games. And one is an old school game you all played before, it's The Floor is Lava. A lot of times it's a fun way of finding new challenges, new moves and exploring your environment in a different way. I'm going to try to start all the way down there and move all the way across the spot without touching the floor. We'll see if I can do it. So this is my first time actually doing this, my first time at this spot. Of course, always check if everything is sturdy. You don't want to break anything, especially yourself. And then let's play. didn't make that. And the good thing about it is that you can like really take your time, it's not a rush. Look at the jumps. Oh sorry plants. I don't want to kill them. Okay wait. It actually went surprisingly well, which makes me feel pretty proud. So now I'm going to make it a little bit more difficult. And that's kind of what you want to do. You want to do it once slowly, get used to it. And once you're comfortable, you want to restrict yourself a little bit more. We're going to try to do it faster. So I'm going to try to pick up the speed a little bit. I'm going to permit myself to use the black railing. I'll only hit the blue one. And I'll permit myself to like use the concrete at the top. I'll just jump from the rail straight away. I'll just try to do it a little bit faster. <laughs> it's so much harder once you try to go fast and you can't take your time. That's really when mistakes happen, so you want to be focused. That was a good one, pretty happy with that. And especially like looking at it the first time, I would have never felt that I could do it that fast. So now, doing it a little bit, make it more difficult getting comfortable, it's really fun now. Why are we 
talking about patience in this world where everybody wants everything now, like me, I want ice cream right now. But sometimes you can't get what you want right now. Especially in free running, you have to do what might be boring now, but it will get you to your goal in the long run. So you really want to be patient and you want to think long term. The most important part right now for you is to build a really solid foundation and get yourself on the right track. Because if you don't do that, this journey could lead you to injury or overuse of your joints and it won't get you in a place where you will enjoy moving at all. So that is the opposite of what you want to do. For free running and parkour, I really try to treat myself as an athlete. I try to look at my whole body. What do I need to do to be strong, to be fit and healthy? And that will then lead me to do the tricks that I want to do. So you want to really take an honest look at yourself think about how fit am I, how strong am I, where am I in my journey, does it make sense for me to try the Kong right now or to try climbing up walls, maybe I should <clears throat> take some more time out of my session to do some push-ups, to do some pull-ups and to focus on strength and flexibility, lose some weight and really get into that way of looking at your body, even if you've never been an athlete before, look at yourself and really think about how can I build my body long term to get me where I want to be in that free running journey. There's this one coach who I've heard say there's two types of athletes. There's mature athletes and there's immature athletes and that has nothing to do with age. The immature athlete, he just wants that reward straight away. He wants to land that trick right now, he wants to get that, he wants to feel that buzz of like throwing himself and like trying something new and long term that will not go well. And then there's mature athletes that are willing to do what they have to do now to get themselves to their goals, even though that might be more boring, maybe they have to go slow in the beginning to go fast afterwards. But that's really important to kind of take a step back and take an honest look and be patient. This is a slow journey. You will start really slow, jumping over little walls and curbs and build your way up slowly. So that's something that I always remind myself as well. So, Right now we're doing wall runs. You're doing wall runs if there's a wall that's too high for you to jump up or jump over, which for me, head height is definitely too high. I think this is a great height to start with. What you want to do is you want to take a few steps back and you want to be kind of jogging at the wall. You don't want to be running too fast. You don't want to be too slow. Really the trick is to use the speed you have from your run up and transition it into upward speed. And that way you can almost get up onto the wall without any strength and it's very effortless if you get the technique right. About a meter away from the wall, you wanna, not, you wanna really not just do a step on the wall, you wanna jump up. And as you jump up, you wanna place your foot around hip height on the wall. And you wanna have like, you know how when you do Tic Tacs, you have this moment where you almost stick on the wall and you want to achieve that same kind of feeling where your foot really grips the wall and then you extend your leg and push up. While you're doing that, you want to place your hands and pull at the same time and not just pull up but also pull a little bit forwards to get your chest above the wall and get into this position. As you can see, you can make it very effortless and that is kind of the goal to practice and work all the variables, work the speed, practice around with the height where you place your foot, really get this pull right and work on all the single elements until you really can make it effortlessly. And the good thing if you have a spot like this, you can work out with a low wall and slowly progress higher. At some point you will encounter a wall where it's too high for you to pull up straight away, but you'll be able to reach out and grab the wall. In that situation, you'll be in a dead hang and you want to develop the strength that you can just pull yourself up and then continue after the wall. Basically, the technique is very similar when it comes to your legs and to the push. Instead of your arms reaching and pushing straight away, you want to really focus on swinging your arms up and giving you that extra height, carrying your chest as high as you can. Some people like to do two steps, for me one step most of the time is the best way to do it and if you can't reach it with two hands, try reaching it with one, that can give you an extra few inches and can really get your hands on the wall. Hold on with all your power and then I'll show you 
how to do a muscle up onto the wall in a second. A lot of times the hardest part of the wall run is not reaching the actual ledge, it's actually getting on top of the wall from the dead hanging position. A lot of you guys won't be able to do this when you initially start training, I couldn't and I will kind of run you through exercises you can do to get there and little cheat techniques and the actual te technique of the climb up or muscle up. So a lot of times you will be hanging in a dead hang and you want to bring your feet up to this position. This will be the standard position you want to start your muscle up from. And then the first thing you will do is you will perform a pull up and you will assist the pull up by pushing with your feet right here. This is what you do. And you want to perform the pull up as fast as you can because that will give you the opportunity to switch your grip to this position. Once you switch your grip, you want to almost transition from pulling upwards to pulling forwards because the key element is getting your chest above the wall. Once you're here, you're safe and all you have to do is push up. Boom. If in the beginning a muscle up is too difficult, it's 100% okay to put your arms down. So this will kind of look like this. You'll pull up and you will put your elbow on top of the wall, which can also look like this. So you pull up, put your elbow down, get your shoulder up here as well, and you want to shift your weight and your chest on top of the wall. Then go from the elbow position and put the other hand down too and then pull up. This is kind of a cheat you can do to build the strength. When you do it, you want to kind of keep in your mind that you want to train both sides equally. So always switch the elbow once you're at the top. One more last little technique that is very helpful to get your feet from here to the top of the wall is this little kick that I'm going to show you now. All right, so what you'll do is you'll be up here and you kind of have to figure out what to do with your legs. You could put them out here, you could put your knee down, kind of don't really want to do that. It's not as pretty. So what free runners do is they will kick one leg back out to get their butt away from the wall. And the other foot, as you see down here, will be pushing off the wall. So this is what you're doing. And then once you kick out, this leg now has space to move in here for you to put your foot down. So in fast, it will look like this. What can you do to train muscle ups? One thing is just training the actual movement separately, which means you want to be doing this. And you also want to be doing this. And the best thing you can actually do is doing a negative climb up, which is starting from the top and lowering yourself as slow as possible to the bottom. By doing this many times in a row, you will slowly, over weeks and weeks probably, build up the strength to do a muscle up on a wall and eventually you'll even be able to do it on a bar without your feet for assistance. They take time, it's a really big challenge, it's one of the most strength intensive parts of free running but you need it again and again and again and having strong muscle ups will aid you a lot in your training. It's kind of lame if you do a big jump and then you look sloppy on your climb up and your exit. So The cool thing about war runs is that you, there's so many of them out there, so many fun challenges you can do with them. The textures of the walls are different, the height is different, the grip at the top is different. A lot of them you can find like this that with varying heights so you can really feel your progression level up, kind of challenge yourself with your friends and they look badass once you get to a good height. This one's really high, I have no idea if I can get it, I'll give it my best. And yeah, it kind of feels like climbing your low Mount Everest in a way. I'm not that far off. I couldn't make it, I'm missing like this much. But conveniently there's this little step up. That's what you kind of want to do when you're out free running. You kind of give yourself a problem to solve, which is overcoming this wall. And I think this might actually give me that extra height and step up that I need to get to the top. The problem is also that now I also have to travel towards the wall a little bit, so the run-up's also a little bit annoying. But I'll try to figure it out, see if it works. My little trick worked. 
Of course, I still haven't climbed Mount Everest the legit way. But this one feels really good. Really, really good. And I kind of want to try the normal one again. Well, I'll have to come back a different day. Another day. And that's the cool thing about free running is that there's no pressure for you to do the trick that day. Don't let your friends pressure you or people you train with. Don't get pressured by people standing there and kind of like hyping you up. Just take your time, progress safely, go step by step by step. Know when to push yourself. And also it's really cool like to know when it's all right to take a step back, come back the next week, next month, next year, and then be really ready for it. Because if you do a jump, you want to do it nice and clean. You don't want to just chuck it. Sounds like an excuse. It is true though. <laughs> so yeah, I hope one day I can post a video where I make it. One of the things that can really complement your training is obviously working out, building the strength in your muscles that support the movement. And for a lot of people, they actually get into free running because they realize it is a really good workout by itself and really the city can replace your fitness studio. You don't have to go and do a boring workout that doesn't excite you. You can go out and use free running as your workout or you could also do traditional like body weight exercises to complement your training. I really enjoy doing that in the urban environment, especially on a day where I maybe don't feel like I want to push my movement or I want to stress about doing the next big jump or the next progression. I kind of just enjoy moving through the environment and using parkour and free running movement as my exercise by just doing them a little bit different, doing them maybe slower or repeating them a lot more often. And there's a lot of things you can do, just like shimmying along walls or doing plyometric jumps and different like jumps that are maybe not your max, but by repeating them often and making them a strength exercise. But doing those, you always want to not overdo it. You want to keep a good balance and just play around with it and kind of do the movements that you feel like already need a lot of strength in your free running sessions and then kind of exaggerating and playing around those and having fun with that and usually you can come up with some really fun challenges and without really feeling it at the end of the day you realize you just got a really full body workout done. That's the palm spin. One of my favorite moves really, because you can just like connect it, you can do nice and flowy lines, it's fun. And if you're having a run, don't know what to do, you can always just palm spin and it kind of looks cool. So, palm spin. The prerequisite is really the turn vault. We explained it earlier. If you can't do that yet, go back, practice the turn vault because that's what it builds on and it will advance into the wall spin, which is a really cool move and you want to learn that. So turn vault, palm spin, builds off the same as a turn ball. This is the arm you'll be turning around and this arm is kind of your safety and support. So for the palm spin you usually want to walk in at like a very medium, almost slow pace and you're going to jump off both of your feet. So you have one arm placed like this, you'll be turning around this arm and you want to make a really small circle. So the further you go out the more difficult you make it for yourself. So jump up and you'll be turning around the circle and to learn it really you just want to be walking on the block. Du -du 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 and you want to slowly progress to using less and less and less in steps. So, one thing you might be doing while practicing it might look like this. I put the foot down to help me on my turn and when you use the foot less and less and less and less. If using the block keeps tempting you to put your foot down and you can't make yourself do it without the foot, another way of practicing it is using a corner like this. So what you want to do is you want to run, run at the block, do a turn ball, and simply just land back on the floor on the other side of the corner. And as you keep going and keep practicing, you want to bring the move and you want to whip it around more and more until you land behind the imaginary wall. So you want to draw a line right here and practice landing behind that. Another thing you could do is you could do it here 
and every time you do it, you will move a little bit more this way until you really are at a spot where you have to do it all the way around. A few things that will really help you is staying as close to your arm as possible and that, that makes it really easy for you to just carry your weight and stay on that arm. Another thing you want to think about is really lifting your butt up, which will carry it around more. And you really want to commit to it as well. You kind of want to jump into it and then just commit to whipping it around and going all the way. Once you've got palm swings, they're really easy, really fun. You can transition them in a lot of combos between different moves and they lead up to the wall spin, which is pretty badass. And you'll see that one soon. Are you ready for the wall spin? That's it, done, now you can do it. What's really important for wall spins is that you can already palm spin and you wanna have, that you won't just be able to do a palm spin, you really wanna have palm spins on lock. What's really cool about wall spins is that it's very similar to a flip and if you're excited about doing flips and doing acrobatics, it's, but you're scared and you don't have any experience, the wall spin is something you can easily transition a normal move, a parkour and free running move, into almost a flip on the wall. And this is really the transition you want. If your palm spins are really good, you want to find a slanted wall. And if you don't have a wall, look around for trees. Trees are often really good. They tend not to grow straight. They give you a lot of slanted options. And this is really nice because for a lot of people, their biggest worry doing wall spins is hitting their feet. But here we kind of got some empty space, so it's a little bit safer. You can find this. If you actually live in London or you want to come to London, you can actually do it here in South Bank. This is the wall. I'm going to show you how to do it. You'll run up. Most importantly, you want to jump from both of your feet. Because I'm turning anti-clockwise, as I jump off, I put my left arm down. And I put it down, while I put it down, I twist it so my fingers point downwards. This way I can turn all the way around it without having to move my arm or change its position. My position for the arm is around hip height. That's where you kind of want to put it. And then, in a way, you want to jump up and over your arm. And if you imagine your butt, your butt will do a nice circular motion. The good thing for this move is that you can really see the floor at all times. Your right hand is kind of going somewhere up here. If it's, a, right now I'm putting it on the ledge. If this was a taller wall, I just put it against the wall. Your right arm kind of, as with the palm spin, will leave the obstacle really soon because you take it off to make room for your body to pass through. All right, so again, run up, twist your arm, put it down at hip height, put your other arm down just for half a second, jump, look at the floor, and let your butt come around. You wanna be really tucked and small. The more tucked and small you are, the easier the trick gets. I'll show you one. Go to run up. Boom. That's it. You really want to start probably with a wall that's even more slanted and slowly get used to it. The hardest thing to do compared to the palm spin is that while the palm spin is a very flat spin, your butt is almost at the same height as your shoulders or your head. For the wall spin, you really want to lift your butt high up. So while your head will be down here, your butt will be actually above you and spin around. And that is something you want to slowly get used to bit by bit finding a few different slanted surfaces and then just give it a go. It's the beat of the wall spin. Oh, I got out of beat. It's the beat of the wall spin. I'm terrible at musician, that's why I'm a free runner. Well, we're doing wall spin on a straight wall, which is really scary the first time. I get you, I get you, I feel you. I was terrified. I hope you spent a lot of time doing it on the slanted wall and now you kind of are up for the challenge to do it on a straight wall. What's important? It's important to really, really commit. You don't want to stop halfway through. That's the worst thing you can do once you go. Keep going and go through towards the end. The worst thing that can happen or the, the thing that generally happens and is a problem is that you scrape your feet because you don't invert enough. That can happen a lot of times. It, if it happens, it's not actually that bad. You just scrape them along and you'll still land and you'll be all right. Another important thing is to really keep your arms straight so you get as much distance from the wall as you can. Of course, they can work for you a little bit, but you really want to keep that distance by keeping the arms straight. Jump up, 
get really high, get your hips around, practice a lot on slanted walls, try to find gradual improvements and then commit, you really gotta just go for it. When it comes to the angle you run towards the wall at, that can really vary from person to person. Generally speaking, running up right next to the wall is terrible, you absolutely do not want to do that. A lot of people love coming at an angle, it definitely works, it can make it more comfortable. Personally, a lot of times I do it just running straight to the wall, I find it a little more difficult. So probably you want to come kind of at a, what is this, a 45 degree angle? You get it, you can see it. Run towards it like that in a little bit of an angle and that will make it easier. It's really preference, you want to experiment with it and try around and find the sweet spot for you. Alright, this one is really easy and fun to me now. I remember when it was terrifying, I remember the day I landed it the first time. I went to bed with a smile and it is really a big achievement if you get the wall spin, even on a, on a slanted wall. That's badass, props to you. The straight wall is really the king's challenge. If you can make that, you're amazing, hat off. Good luck on the wall spin, enjoy, have fun with it, and make it easy. I'm holding the camera now because Giles, who's been filming this amazing tutorial, he's gonna do a wall spin now too. It's been a while. Oh, gangster. <laughs> I'm done. I'm filming the rest of the video myself. Sick, this fine. is a pre running tutorial. Now, POV style. Check this shit out. Oh, shit. I think I broke his camera. This is the microphone, what do I do? Alright, so now I'm going to show you what we kind of do if we have a, have a jump that's technical for us, it's a little bit difficult, we won't get it every time we try it, but we'd love to like build up and get it really safely. So for me, this is this kind of jump, which is a little bit more advanced than what we teach in the tutorial, but I kind of have to illustrate a point with something that is technical for me to do, and then you have to find a jump that's your size and just apply the same principle of training and working on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make safe that I can do this jump, that I can do it pretty confidently. And this means doing it three times in a row and sticking it. Because that's the one free running rule we kind of give ourselves is that once is never. It's not about just doing a jump, it's about doing it controlled and really adding it to your skill set and being able to repeat it. So once doesn't count, only counts if you can land it three times in a row. So that's what I'm going to do with this, come to precision and then I'll kind of build around it and make it a little bit more difficult to myself. Let's go. So as you can see, attempt one, went a little too short, was a little bit too careful, but I just bounced off and now number two, good. Oh, number one. All right, number two. Oh, no, I went too far. Doesn't count, I have to start from the beginning. Number one. That was a little, a little tough landing. <laughs> Number three. I did it. Oh, celebration dance. It counts. Feeling a little bit more difficult right now. I'm gonna add a trick, a little flip up to this bench, and then try to do this one straight afterwards. And then I also have to do that three times in a row, so let's see how that goes. Woo! Scary. Oh, that was scary. I can walk. Ho oh, ho! No! I committed though, like that's the worst thing you can do for any move is if you get scared halfway, don't change your mind, don't stop because you can't go back, you gotta keep going. So even on this one, as I was already committed to the Kong, I was like, oh, I'm not gonna make it. 
but you got to commit on like hitting that next ledge and bouncing off if you don't do that that's when the worst like injuries happen and then when when it gets dangerous is when you start changing your mind midway rather take some more time before thinking about it think about what you will do when it goes wrong so then if it happens you can just react you don't have to think in between while you're in the air all right three in a row so I got that and now once I added something to the beginning of the move and when we started this concrete which was already difficult then I added the Webster which was scary for me as well and I already feel how those are becoming easier so now is the right time for me to add something to the end of it so all I want to do is I want to precision to this wall and then precision up on top to the next wall and stick it once I get that I'm happy so I've got to do it three times though let's give it a go Maybe this is not even, I didn't get it perfect and it didn't get it like as good as it could be. But if, if I think about 30 minutes ago, rocking up to the spot, if somebody would have showed me this line, I would have said, no way I can do it. But then you kind of play it like a puzzle or play it like building a house and playing Legos. You have to always start with one element and kind of stack them on top of each other. And then all of a sudden you realize, okay, I can, I can do it as you get comfortable with every segment. And that's really what you see a lot of like runs and videos that are really long and technical. A lot of times it feels like these people just rock up to the spot and bust out a line. But this is literally what goes into every line. You go through the steps, you build the house, and in the end you nail it. And what was difficult before is then easy. And that's also how you really develop flow and learn how to connect movements is by putting yourself in a situation like this. Find, a, find a, a move that's challenging to you and then add something to the end of it and add something, something in front of it and then challenge yourself to connect it. And this is really fun. Yo, you're still here. We made it, the end of the tutorial. I hope now you feel like you learned something. I hope now you feel like you can go out and try shit. If you don't, that's also okay because you're not meant to have everything figured out when you go into something new. So just pick one of the moves that feels the easiest for you, that seems the most accessible and just go out and play. You don't have to learn it all in one day and you kind of figure out your own journey as you go along. Find some guys already do it, bring out some friends to learn it with you and yeah, be safe, take care and I hope one day maybe we have a session together. <laughs>